Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Onc Live Peer Exchange discussion on management of advanced breast cancer. Today, I'll be joined by a panel of leading experts in the field of breast cancer research for a very informative discussion on the latest advances in treatment. My colleagues and I will be covering the data that has come out over the last few months, including information from ASCO 2016, and adding important perspective on how you can use this information in clinical practice. I am Dr. Adam Brusky, and I am a professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh and associate director for clinical investigation at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. Participating today on our very distinguished panel are Dr. Carlos Arteaga, professor of medicine and cancer biology, director of the Center for Cancer Targeted Therapies, director of the breast cancer program at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, Dr. Kimberly Blackwell, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy, Chair of Breast Cancer Research at Baylor Charles A. Sammons Cancer Center, Texas Oncology and U.S. Oncology in Dallas, Texas. And finally, Dr. Sunil Verma, Professor and Head of the Department of Oncology at the University of Calgary and Medical Director at the Tom Baker Cancer Center in Calgary, Canada. Thank you so much for joining us and let's begin. The first thing we really want to talk about, I think, is uh, hormone receptor uh, advanced and metastatic, uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And really the first thing, I think, uh, to talk about is kind of a little bit more on a kind of a basic science topic for a minute. It actually has clinical relevance, and that is um, mechanisms of resistance. I think there's been a lot of excitement recently about estrogen receptor mutations. Um, and I'll start with uh, Carlos. I mean, what do you think of ER mutations and kind of what's been discussed at ASCO and kind of where do you think that's going? Well, I think ER mutations are probably a major discovery uh, in that they are uh, a real mechanism of resistance to estrogen deprivation with aromatase inhibitors. Uh, mechanistically, uh, I think this makes a lot of sense. There are uh, mutations in the ER that dispense of that need of estradiol, therefore these tumors progress on aromatase inhibitors. But fortunately, they seem to be sensitive to uh, other interventions like ER down regulators like fulvestrant and suggest that these new ER and regulators that we are developing may be very effective against them. So I think uh, it's, uh, what is remarkable is that up to 30% of patients that progress on an aromatase inhibitor in the metastatic setting have these alterations. Right. And suggest also that we should deploy, uh, and the, we can find them actually in plasma without the need of a tissue biopsy. Uh, and suggest also the fact that we may need to start thinking of the incorporating eventually into our standard of care, measuring these mutations in plasma in patients that progress on an aromatase inhibitor. Okay. So, I mean, Sunil, so at this year's ASCO, there was two abstracts that actually looked at uh, ER mutations and prognosis as well as response to various therapies. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah. So there were two, um, two very important abstracts. So the first one was looking at what is the frequency of ESR mutations, and there was about a 30% or so frequency rate, and they found, as Carlos mentioned, that they were seen in only in those patients who have prior aromatase inhibitor therapy, um, looking at uh, cell-free DNA, and they didn't see any of this in patients who have prior tamoxifen, so it is a very treatment-dependent uh, effect. They also saw, interestingly enough, that they were more likely to occur in patients who had bone metastases versus visceral metastases, again, telling us that maybe the biology of disease may tell us a little bit about what type of resistance and how this uh, natural history will evolve. So Paloma 3, presented by Nick Turner, which is a study looking at palbocyclic plus fulvestrant versus fulvestrant plus placebo, they looked at patients who had ESR1 mutations, and they found that despite these mutations, there was a benefit favoring palbocyclic, i.e., ESR1 mutation was not a resistant to CDK4-6 inhibitor. So this was, I think, one of the key d uh, data points to come out of this study, showing that they're still effective in patients with ESR mutation. Correct, yeah. There also, there was an interesting biological insight in that presentation, is that the patients that uh, had had prior uh, response to endocrine therapy, that had showed you some evidence of being luminal and hormone dependent, were those that developed acquired ER mutations, whereas those that did not, did not develop ER mutations. Really? So that is really fascinating. That so really, neat. tumors are going to be using whatever they know works. Yeah. And if right. they are not, so, so the fact that they did not respond to endocrine therapy to begin with means that they were not using the ER maybe. Mm -hmm. Hence, they're not going to mutate that pathway because they may have other ways 
of coming around. Yeah, so and really they showed that patients who had PA3 kinase mutations, a third of the patients who had PA3 kinase mutations also had ESR mutations as well. Correct. So they're not mutually exclusive. That not there at may all. Be some well, I thought PA3 there. kinase, wasn't PA3 kinase kind of more related to the luminal subtypes, or more luminal low aggressive subtypes, or not? I'm not sure yet. Yeah. I'm not sure yet. So Joyce, would you use ER mutations now in your practice at all? Would you, would you subtype patients? Would you do an ER assay since it's available? No, I don't think it's really, uh, really, ac you know, specifically actionable right, right now. You know, I think that it's very important. I think it may have potentially some implications when we have choices in the adjuvant setting, potentially. I think that's a really important question for us to work out because um, most of these, as Carlos said, have been emerging in uh, metastatic aromatase inhibitor therapy. We, I don't think we know yet about adjuvant um, AI therapy, but um, no, we're not going to change our practice patterns because, um, you know, it, we're going to use the CDK4-6 uh, inhibitors. And um, there was also data, correct me if I'm wrong, with regard to the Bolero 2 and the ESR1 mutations and um, Everolimus, and it didn't make any difference there either. So, you know, the Everolimus is going to work no matter which way um, uh, patients, whether they have them or not. So I think we're just going to continue to treat patients as we do anyway, and um, I, so I don't think we need to um, check for it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Carlos, though. The way I'm using it is in patients who haven't had full vestrant. If I see this on a Foundation 1 or some other type of genomic sequencing assay, I certainly, fulvestrant goes higher on my list. And um, in general, at this, that ASCA this year, we showed that, or I didn't show, but it was shown that these, the presence of these mutations, the patient's overall survival is worsened if you see these mutations in their tumors. So I think that's a reflection of they're kind of no longer eligible for the endocrine therapy because they've developed these mutations in the setting of chronic therapy more so than a, a worse kind of biology of this disease. So I think we've learned some, that was the largest series ever presented at this year's meeting of ER mutations. Yeah. I agree, but however, for the patient who is seeking a clinical trial, I think that there are trials now that enroll yeah. uh, based on these mutations to trials with ER done regulators that I believe in eventually we may become standard of care. I, so I, agree so with I think you. in that setting, uh, it's for those patients, I think it's probably important that they know that there are options for them. So if there. you have it, so in other words, if you have an ESR mutation, you should probably get something like fulvestrin as opposed to a SERM or a CERD. Is that kind of what you're going at? What you're I would here? say in the absence of a clinical trial, uh, that, that to, to another, a new SERD, yeah. uh, fulvestrin would be a better choice based on the data we have, we have seen and the data in the laboratory too. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and for those patients who maybe got a dose or two of fulvestrin for whatever reason didn't get it, those are few and far between, I certainly consider recycling it when I see these ESR mutations.